Okay, it's two minutes after two. We're going to get started here. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. We're excited to have everyone on today's Nanobubbles versus Aeration webinar. We have a ton of great information in this presentation, and we, we hope it's helpful for everybody. To make sure you have the best experience, I wanted to go over a couple features during this webinar. The first is the chat feature. Anytime you have a question throughout the presentation, please ask it through the chat box, and we'll be sure to answer these questions at the end of the presentation. The second feature you can utilize is the poll. We'll have a couple poll questions in the presentation that we encourage you to participate in. The next thing I wanted to mention is that this will be recorded. So if you'd like to watch it again or share it with a friend, a link will be provided in a follow-up email later today or on our website. Lastly, there will be a survey at the end of our webinar. Please take a moment to provide your feedback on today's presentation. One random survey participant will be given a $50 Amazon gift card and a Solitude swag bag. The Solitude swag bag is pretty cool. So be sure to take, take it after the presentation for a chance to win. Next, I wanna tell you a little bit about our presenters. I'm Josh McGarry. I will be your host today and I'm the regional sales manager for Florida. I'm responsible for all the development and performance of all sales activities in Florida. I've been in lake management for 13 years. Six years of my, the first six years of my tenure were on the operations side and the last seven years have been a combination of operations and business development. I'm very excited for the opportunity to host today's webinar on nanobubble technology and aeration. I'm very passionate about our ability to provide sound science-based solutions for lake management. Two of which being bottom aeration and nanobubble technology. Aeration is a tried and true water quality restoration method that has been proved over the years. Nanobubble is an exciting new technology that is utilized as an alternative herbicide-free treatment method in annual lake management plants. Our experts, Shannon and Nick, are going to dive into the details on each today. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Shannon Jr. and Nick Diamond. Shannon is an aquatic ecologist at Solitude where she is one of our top experts for freshwater management. She has worked in the lake and pond man management industry for 20 years and has extensive experience with submerged aeration systems, fountains, and educating clients on sustainable solutions and best management practices. Shannon develops and custom lake management plans to enhance her clients' water bodies to include custom submerged aeration solutions, fountain installs, and new nanobubble treatments. Shannon earned her Bachelor of Science in Biology and Master's in Environmental Science and Public Policy from George Mason University. Next, we have Nick Diner. Nick is the CEO of a leading nanobubble technology company. Since the company's inception over three years ago, it has rapidly expanded to 25 countries with over 400 nanobubble systems installed globally, more than any other nanobubble technology company in the world. Nick has extensive experience in product management for various water-focused companies and continues to en enhance freshwater resources through nanobubble technology. We will hear from Nan uh, Shannon and Nick later on. We have a great webinar planned for today, so let's get started. Next, I want to talk about some of the agenda items we'll be touching base on. Uh, first is the importance of dissolved oxygen. Well, oh, fun fact here, did you know that fish require at least four milligrams per liter or parts per million to survive, of dissolved, dissolved oxygen to survive? Uh, nanobubbles uh, and versus aeration, how they complement each other and the differences between them. Uh, next, Shannon's gonna talk about the science behind aeration as well as the benefits and fountains of fountains and submerged aeration. Um, next, we're going to go, go to Nick, and he's going to talk about the science behind, behind nanobubble technology and the benefits of nanotechnology. And then we're going to wrap that up with uh, solutions that best fit your goals. And then finally, we're going to finish with uh, some Q&A. Next, I want to talk about, uh, we're going to have a quick poll to understand, help understand our audience and better tailor our program. Question number one, what type of water body do you own? Or manage? Is it A, a community lake or stormwater pond? B, 
golf course lake or pond, C, a large lake or reservoir, or D, a private lake or pond. I'm going to take a, a quick minute here and let the results come up. Great. Well, it looks like uh, looks like a majority of you either have a community lake or interested in community lake or stormwater pond, or you have a private lake or pond. This is excellent because we're going to cover a lot of your questions on our webinar tonight. So we'll go into the next polling question, and that is, what are the management goals for your water body? Is it A, to mitigate algae blooms or other water quality issues? B, reduce sediment buildup or muck buildup? C, increase aesthetics from a water feature, or D, improve your fisheries. Again, we'll take a couple minutes and let it tabulate the results. Okay, looks like the results are in, and this is uh, pretty overwhelming. Most of us, uh, overwhelming results here. Most of everybody is interested in mitigating algae blooms and other water quality issues. Well, that's great because this is this is definitely going to answer your questions here and um, hopefully shed some light on some of your questions. So, um, so after these polling questions, why is dissolved oxygen or DO so important? Dissolved oxygen naturally occurs at the water surface. Poor circulation can prevent DO from reaching areas of lakes and ponds where it's needed, which can cause anaerobic bacteria, anaerobic conditions, and promote poor water quality. When DO levels are low, it can lead to water quality issues such as bad odors, uh, like a rotten egg smell, um, algae blooms, potentially toxic, which is that blue-green algae or cyanobacteria that everybody hears about in the summertime, um, muck buildup, and, uh, and potentially fish pills all of which nobody wants in their water bodies. You know, you can, you can monitor your dissolved oxygen levels through annual water quality testing. Why is monitoring DO levels so important? It's important to monitor DO levels through regular water quality testing to maintain proper levels before they get too low and have negative effects on fisheries and overall water or or Restoring a water body from a poor state is much harder to do and more costly than being proactive. Having a comprehensive lake management uh, assessment performed by a professional lab will help you understand your water body on a deeper level. Data from these assessments will allow lake and pond professionals to tail, custom tailor a management plan which helps address the underlying issues in your water body. Typically, these underlying issues are the root cause of your pond problems. Improving water quality will help correct the underlying issues. There are many sustainable solutions to correcting poor water quality and restoring imbalanced DO conditions. Each have their own unique benefits and limitations. Shannon is going to dive a little deeper into one of these solutions and talk about aeration. Take it away, Shannon. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. There are three management tools that we use for improving dissolved oxygen levels. And the choice of which tool is best would be dependent on the water quality and on the specific characteristics of each water body. First, we'll talk about fountains, then we'll discuss submersed aeration, and then I'll turn it over to Nick to discuss nanobubble treatment. First though, I did want to clear up a little bit of confusion about the difference between nanobubbles and aeration. Nanobubbles and aeration are not the same. Um, nanobubbles do add oxygenation benefits to the water body, but they don't give the same circulation benefits that you would get from a fountain or an aeration system. So we look at nanobubbles as more of a treatment, whereas fountains and aeration systems would be considered a proactive water quality improvement strategy. With that in mind, um, we can talk a little bit about oxygen dynamics. It's important to understand the natural processes that take place in a water body. And during the summer, 
ponds and lakes become stratified and you'll get a layer of warmer oxygen rich water at the surface whereas down towards the bottom there's less oxygen and the water is cooler and you probably notice that if you've ever swam in a pond or a lake where you, you know you get in that warm water at the surface and then down by your feet the water is cooler and that that water tends to have less oxygen and be less healthy than at the surface and when the weather cools off in the fall that stratification breaks down and the water body mixes and that poor water from the bottom comes up with a lot of organic matter and can cause water quality imbalances and in extreme conditions you can get a fish kill at that time as well unfortunately it can also happen at other times of the year so um, if you have a bad weather event like a a rainstorm that can actually cause that the water column to mix and and um, you'll have that water column turnover. If you constantly mix the water column with a fountain or an aeration system, then you don't get that stratification and you're not susceptible to that sudden turnover. Now we can discuss the science behind fountains. Um, Fountains are ideal in small, shallow water bodies. You have a float on the surface that has a motor mounted to it that sucks up water and sprays it up in the air. And as those, as those droplets hit the surface of the water, they create turbulence and they release submerged gases from the water. So it's an excellent tool to mix the top layer of the water column and prevent stagnation. Fountains are available from half horsepower up to 60 horsepower. So it's important to properly size and place the units in the water body. So if you have a small round pond, you could put a single unit in the middle of that pond and you would get good benefits throughout the water body. Whereas if you were looking at a long, thin water body or a lake that had a lot of fingers or coves, you would need multiple units throughout the water body in order to get the same benefits. Another advantage of a fountain is obviously the aesthetics, the pretty spray pattern, and there's a lot of different patterns available. Um, you can also get lighting packages. There's both clear and colored RGBW packages that can be added to the fountain. Now we can talk about submersed aeration. Submersed aeration is ideal for large, deep water bodies um, just because it circulates better. There's an, um, an onshore compressor that pumps air through subsurface tubing to diffusers that sit on the bottom of the pond. And as the bubbles rise up, they bring that poorly oxygenated water up to the surface where it interacts with atmospheric oxygen. And then as it sinks back down, you get that constant pattern of circulation and improved dissolved oxygen throughout the water column. So when you have, again, that thoroughly mixed water column, you don't get that stratification and you don't get that sudden turnover. There's other benefits of aeration as well. Um, it converts nutrients to biologically unavailable forms, which can prevent water quality issues. It prevents the surface of the water from freezing. So during the winter months, it provides access for waterfowl and for wildlife. It um, provides access for fishing and it can alleviate safety concerns from people walking around on the surface of a partially frozen water body. Similar to fountains though, it's, it's extremely important to size them properly and to place the diffusers correctly. In a small water body, you know, we can take a couple of measurements. We could get input from the owner and probably size a unit pretty well, but for larger water bodies, it's important to have better information. So for larger lakes, a lot of times we would recommend a bathymetric study where we would actually go out and measure the depths of the water body and calculate the water volume. And that way we can properly specify the correct unit and make sure that the diffusers are placed properly. If you can't get power to the edge of your pond, there are solar and windmill options available. The electrical systems are the best. They are the most efficient and they have the highest oxygen transfer 
ratio, but if you just absolutely can't get power, they, there are those alternatives available. The last thing to talk about with fountains and aeration systems is that they complement each other very well. Just because one technology or the other is better for a water body doesn't mean you couldn't have both. So if you need submersed aeration in a large lake because of the depth, that doesn't mean that you couldn't also install a fountain for the aesthetic benefit. And if you add a diffuser underneath a fountain, it will prevent the water from freezing in the winter. So you can actually run that fountain 24 seven in colder climates where they might otherwise need to be removed or shut off for the winter. But, you know, as I've mentioned a couple of times before, the most important thing is, is sizing and placement of the equipment. With that, I'll turn it over to Nick to talk about nanobubbles. Thanks, Adam, and thank you all for giving me the opportunity to tell you about how nanobubble technology improves water bodies such as ponds and lakes. But before we get there, let me tell you a bit about what nanobubbles are. So when we're talking about nanobubbles, we're talking about bubbles that are 100 nanometers in diameter. To put that in perspective, that's 2,000 times smaller than a grain of salt. When bubbles get that small, they exhibit unique properties that separate them from all other bubbles. And that's what the images on this chart are trying to show. The first is that bubbles of that size don't float. They don't come to the surface and pop, what you'll see with typical aeration systems that Josh and Shannon were sharing before. Instead, the bubbles will travel evenly throughout the body of water at all depths and all points, kind of like blowing smoke into a room. The second is that the bubble, the nanobubbles provide a natural strong oxidant some of the hydrogen peroxide or other chemicals that you might often use to try to treat and control algae. And third, the bubbles actually have a surface charge. And that surface charge prevents the bubbles from coalescing or coming together to form larger bubbles, which would then flow to the surface, but also allows the bubbles to bond to particles that are suspended in water of the opposite charge and use them to try to separate those particles from, from liquids or from water. Um, we use nanobubbles or our customers deploy nanobubbles in a variety of different industries. Uh, we use bubbles to improve waste, industrial wastewater processes. We use nanobubbles to improve produced waters coming out of oil and gas production facilities. We use them extensively in irrigation to enhance crop development from irrigation water that's been saturated with oxygen nanobubbles. We also use them in fish farming, aquaculture facilities, both onshore and offshore to improve fish, fish growth. But today we're obviously gonna be talking about how to use air and oxygen nanobubbles to improve aquatic <laughs> ecosystems like ponds and lakes. So nanobubbles have been researched extensively um, for decades now. It's only the last three or four years that companies like ours, Moliere, has deployed nanobubbles commercially into various different industries that I mentioned before. Today, our company has over 400 systems installed, 80 of which are treating lakes and ponds throughout the country, primarily in Florida, but also now uh, across the, the Midwest and West Coast <clears throat> as well. Some of the university research that we've done not only looks at the, the properties and benefits of nanobubbles, but how to use them in different applications. Uh, one university we worked with right away was UCLA here in Los Angeles, and they helped us understand what are the true benefits of nanobubbles when deployed into clean water and wastewater bodies to understand their benefits. The first is the oxygen transfer efficiency. That's looking at how much of the gas, or in this case oxygen, dissolves into the water when it's introduced. Uh, the measurements they sell off calculate at 86 percent. That's about as high as you're ever going to see. More importantly, it validates that the bubble's not floating to the surface and popping. If the bubble was rising to the surface, you'd be transferring only two to three percent per foot of water as it dissolves until it reaches the top. So this gives good validation of the bubbles that we're producing are not floating. Uh, the second is after the point of aeration or injection of bubbles into the water, those bubbles are going to continue to, to stay in that body of water until they react. That reaction could be the oxidation that we talked about earlier. It could be the bonding with a particulate uh, that's suspended in the water and creating some sort of density change for flotation, or it could be the continued dissolving or dissolution of the oxygen into the water. And it's these types of benefits related to oxidation and the ability of the bubbles not floating and continuing to dissolve in the water that provide the benefits that we're gonna talk about today around the use of nanobubbles in uh, improving 
bodies of water for algae control and algae treatment. Next, let me show you a bit about how nanobubble systems are installed and what happens from this through this image when the nanobubble is introduced. So starting in the top right, our technology is a shore mounted system. And it acts a little bit like a kidney or an umbilical, we often are told, where the water is pumping through our system, the nanobubbles being formed as the air gets injected into the water, and then it gets reintroduced back into the pond or lake. And you can see through the image on the right, what's happening is in this particular example, which is most commonly how it's deployed, we're trying to bring the bubbles to the bottom near the sediment to increase the dissolved oxygen levels near the bottom of the pond, where we can help the beneficial bacteria that may be short of oxygen become aerobic and then be able to flourish and start consuming the nutrients and outcompete the algae for its food source. We're also introducing the bubbles there to start the oxidation of them, again, acting like, a, like an alternative to chemistry to try to lyse or break apart the algae cells and destroy the toxins as they're being released. What it doesn't do, and where the benefits of aeration come in, as Shannon and Josh were talking about, is the mixing of the water. Nanobubbles are not going to flow to the surface, as I mentioned, so you're not going to get that mixing of the water throughout the body where aeration can be very beneficial. We also know that the aeration helps in promoting the nanobubbles' reactions in that water. So in certain cases, the combination of two provide better treatment and a better overall outcome. And to that point, next, let's talk a little bit about why we refer to it as a treatment as opposed to aeration. So one of the most common questions we get is, how long does it take for nanobubbles to work? When am I going to see results? Nanobubbles are not a, chemi a chemistry. We're not going to hit it fast and, you know, within hours, within days, the algae is gone. This is a treatment that takes time to take effect and why it's a continuous treatment. And as you continue to run it, you'll have the algae under control and will prevent the blooms from reoccurring. So you can see in the left some of these time intervals from the images. Top left, obviously, being at the installation the pond uh, uh, covered with algae in this case. Over th after 30 days, you start to see it dissipate, and after 60 days, it's gone. In fact, often in the first 14 to 30 days, we'll see that the lake looks worse before it gets better. And we get a lot of questions, people asking, hey, it's not working. What's wrong here? And actually, what's happening is we're starting to die off the algae. As the uh, biology and the body of water change, as the <clears throat> beneficial bacteria starts to take effect and is competing with the algae, as the algae is being oxidized, often peeling off the bottom, you start to see more algae form at the surface before it finally turns a corner. And then you see the benefit that you see either in those examples at time equals 60 days or even in the after example. And on the right are a couple images of our systems being installed. Sometimes it's one system, sometimes it's two systems. It really depends on the size of the body of water and what kind of nanobubble system that in our case, we're offering to be able to provide the treatment necessary for, uh, for us to help that customer get control of the algae and treat the algae in the pond or lake. So next, let's take a look at some uh, case studies or examples that we've done. This is actually one of the first projects we ever did and this was with Solitude in Florida, deploying our nanobubble system on a body of water, 1.3 acre pond, so a small pond, where uh, Solitude and the client were struggling to get control of the algae that you can see in some of the image, on the images on the left around the edge of the pond. Once they deploy our system, after about eight weeks of treatment, what you see in the after photos is that we were able to turn the corner, get the algae treated and under control. And since then, systems have been running there to maintain uh, a healthy body of water with elevated dissolved oxygen levels to prevent the algae growth. And next, what you're gonna look at is what we really care about seeing in terms of the performance of the bubbles and the unique nature of what the bubbles will do. And that can be measured through dissolved oxygen levels at various points and various depths. So in this particular project, we had one nanobubble generator sitting along the side of the pond and you can sort of see in the lower left corner of both pictures the, two, the pipe for, that's from the intake and discharge to our nanobubble generator into the pond. And what we want to see, if the nanobubbles are behaving the way nanobubbles should, that the dissolved oxygen levels at all points are rising, meaning the bubbles are truly spreading out like blowing smoke into a room throughout the pond or lake, and that the oxygen levels at all depths are starting to rise and starting to match. So you can see at two feet below the surface versus eight people, eight feet below the surface, at all points away from what's called the aerator, because at the time they were still referring to as aeration, the oxygen levels rising and rising evenly. And this is good evidence of the, the benefit 
and the, the, the unique behavior of a nanobubble relative to larger bubbles that are just going to rise vertically in a water column. We look for the same thing in larger bodies of water. So next we'll take a look at a project that not be, not two acres, but over 20 acres. In this particular case, we had one of our larger systems, which you can see tucked away behind some of those pine trees there with the six inch pipes going in and out. And again, single, single point of treatment covering this over 20 acre body of water. And treatment time took a little bit longer to take effect due to the size and the, the time of year. And you can see before the body of water, obviously, green algae over time, the algae getting under control and getting <clears throat> getting uh, the, the treatment to truly take effect. And similar to what we showed before, what we'll look at next here are the elevations and dissolved oxygen at all depths uh, throughout the water column. And this particular body of water was a bit deeper than the others. This was over 10 feet deep. And in this particular case, what we want to see, what we always want to see when we're looking at uh, the benefits of nanobubbles is elevation and dissolved oxygen at the deepest points. Again, that's where that beneficial bacteria that we want to see start to flourish and start to uh, uh, go to work, per se, and get the uh, nutrients under control and outcompete the algae. It's important that we see that oxygen levels increase down below. And it's showing here that, again, we're not necessarily uh, mixing, but we're providing oxygen evenly and moving that oxygen curve higher DO at all depths due to the nature of the way those bubbles are gonna, are gonna behave. So, uh, you know, as we look beyond this, in terms of some of the other types of, uh, of benefits you'll see, we've worked with fountains, we've worked with aeration. The combination of two always provides uh, more rapid or beneficial treatment. <clears throat> again, that's why we refer to it as treatment, not aeration. And you can see in some of these images before, again, algae along the sides, uh, algae along the surface, <clears throat> and then afterwards, over time, and each time, each project being unique, every body of water being unique, the algae coming under control. And the photo that I like best that we share, I think this was uh, one point that was brought up in the survey earlier, was around the sediment yeah, sediment control and reduction of sediment is in that lower right corner. What one of the uh, sort of emotional reactions that our customers uh, provide us is when they start to see the muck at the bottom of their pond or lake disappear. And that's being either digested by the bacteria, the beneficial bacteria, or being oxidized by the oxidation potential of the bubble. But eventually, you start to see that sandy surface, and it truly, you know, shows that that treatment taking full effect. And in this particular case, that's what we're showing there in that lower right corner. So with that, I will hand it back to Josh to to wrap up. Thank you. Thanks, Nick and Shannon. We, we definitely appreciate you sharing your expertise here. Um, fountains, sunburst aeration, and nanobubble treatments all work differently, and they all accomplish very different things. Uh, pairing these systems will help you better target your water quality problems. For, for example, if you're experiencing swarming adult midge flies, ish, midge fly issues, the best long-term solution for midge to manage midge populations is to have an integrated or multifaceted approach. One of these vital steps is to properly aerate to improve your water quality. Aeration also gives predatory fish like brim or a better opportunity to get to the larvae, which live in the benthos or bottom of the lake. Pairing aeration with nanobubbles will also dis disrupt the larval habitat in the muck as well as better control the food source, which is the food source of the larva, which is algae. No matter if you use your water body to fish recreationally or simply for aesthetics, it's beneficial to utilize these products and it's, benef it's beneficial to utilize these products, excuse me, uh, to proactively management, manage the solutions to increase DO levels and prevent water quality issues from developing. We're committed to the results. Contact us if you'd like to introduce nanobubble treatments or aeration into your water water body uh, to manage your solutions. We will work with you until you reach your management goal and are satisfied with the results. Let's move on to some Q&A. All right, uh, this first one is from Matt in Florida. Uh, how much does nanobubble and bottom aeration cost? It's a very common question, Matt. Um, as everybody, water body is unique. Uh, both Shannon and Nick mentioned that. Uh, it really depends on the acreage, the volume, and specific goals that for your lake that determine the cost. 
my suggestion is to contact us for a consultation and there is a quick a survey at the end where you'll be able to to do that at the end of the webinar all right let's see next question scott from florida does aeration or nano bubbles help with aquatic weed control i'm gonna send this one over to shannon thanks josh um not directly um higher dissolved oxygen levels in the water body do reduce the quantity of available nutrients but if you have an established weed bloom the plants will still be able to get enough nutrients from the sediment to grow so um, aeration wouldn't be a good method of weed control but that being said it can overcome some of the issues caused by weed bloom so for instance after an herbicide treatment or during fall senescence when the plants begin to die off that um, causes low dissolved oxygen conditions and if you have an aeration system running that can prevent um, you know a fish kill potentially there's also um, duckweed and water meal or two plants you can actually see that uh, it looks like that bottom middle pond may be duckweed growing on a pond if you have um, one of those plants that coats the surface of the pond, a, a fountain or an aeration system can actually keep an area of the water open and those plants really thrive in stagnant environments. So in that case, maybe you would get some benefits, but in general, it would not be used for weed control. Great, thanks Shannon. Um, next question, Frank's, Frank from Texas. Uh, how can aeration and nanobubbles improve my fishery? I'll grab this one. Um, Nanobubbles and aeration uh, will enhance the overall health of the pond, which, which does improve your fishery. Increases dissolved oxygen, which can improve their habitat. It allows them to swim uh, all the way from the surface to the bottom. Um, and then here's a, a second part to that question is, will aeration and nanobubbles kill the good algae needed in fisheries? Aeration and nano will target the conditions that promote blue green algae or toxic algae via disrupting the TN or TP ratio. What I mean by TN and TP is total nitrogen, and total phosphorus. This is done by promoting aerobic bacteria or the good bacteria. Next question, Chris from Maryland. How long do nanobubble, how long do nanobubbles results last and how long until you see the results? I'm gonna pass this one over to Nick. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So uh, every body of water is, is truly unique. So there's no universal answer. But we do believe that nanobubbles should be uh, introduced or, or injected continuously into the body of water to maintain uh, the health of that, that uh, pond or lake. So we look at it as a permanent installation. In terms of time for the treatment to take effect, it varies. We, we've seen it happen in weeks. We've seen it happen after two or three months. It usually doesn't take longer than that. Great. Thanks, Nick. Um, next one is Michael from New York. Uh, is aeration necessary if we occasionally do nanobubble treatments? Um, this one's Shannon. Why don't you take this one? Okay. Well, yeah, I feel like we, we're starting to sound like a broken record here, but it depends. Um, you know, it really depends on the characteristics of the water body and, and what your management goals are. Um, you know, how how deep is the water body? Does it stratify? Are you trying to control algae? Are you trying to improve habitat? Um, are you just trying to improve water quality? Um, you know, there we would need some some more information in order to answer that question. And really, you know, it's important to evaluate a pond, but any management strategy needs to be adaptive and you know multiple practices may be needed over time so again it, it kind of depends and the answer may be different tomorrow than it is today thanks shannon um now we have one from michael in virginia um, do you need a permit to have nanobubbles in your water body uh nick this one's for you yeah, no, that's an, another good question and a question we get often. So, so the answer is you do not. Um, Moliere's nanobubble system has an EPA registration as a pesticide device, and that's that's what's required. You do not need a permit to deploy nanobubbles into ponds or lakes. Um, obviously, it's always state dependent, but as far as we understand, that is not necessary. 
Great, thanks, Nick. Um, next question, this one's from Chris in Mississippi. Um, do beneficial buffers interfere with, with nanobubble installations? Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and grab this one. Uh, that's a great question, Chris. Um, no, uh, the answer is no. Uh, beneficial buffers will not interfere with nanobubble installs. As you can see from Nick's uh, photos before, um, there's very minimal impact. Uh, the cabinet and um, uh, compression station is, is actually up a similar size to it, the aeration cabinet, and you can hide that with, you know, with shrubs and things like that. So no, it will not interfere with your beneficial buffers. And also, I do want to mention before we go on to the next question is that, you know, our, our staff will work with your property to ensure there are no damages when installing nanobubble or aeration technology. So, well, uh, great question. Though. We'll move on to the next question. Uh, this is from Samantha from Virginia. How long or frequently do aerators need to run? Shannon? Um, well, fountains and aeration systems are intended to run 24-7. Um, they, you only get the benefits of the systems while they're operating. And dissolved oxygen actually has a daily cycle in the water body. And during the night when there's no photosynthesis occurring, when the phytoplankton and the plants aren't creating oxygen, that's when the dissolved oxygen levels are the lowest. So it, it really is ideal to run the system constantly. That's what, that would be the plan. Great, thanks Shannon. Um, let's see, next question, Dustin from Texas. Uh, do nanobubbles affect fish and wildlife? Nick, I'll let you handle this one. Yeah, so, so uh, no, thanks for asking. It's, it's become very timely. Um, the fastest growing segment for our company has been in fisheries and uh, aquaculture and, and improving the, um, the body of water where you're growing fish. So now we've had a lot of success there. Um, uh, certainly don't see any sort of adverse effects there at all. The nanobubbles have, have truly created differentiated value. So it's a, it's a market that we work closely with sold it on, the domestically in the US and then internationally as well in other parts of the world. Great, yeah, thanks Nick, that was a great question. Um, next one, we have Mike in Florida. Which of these methods would be uh, best to reduce midges and mosquitoes? Uh, I'm gonna take this question. Um, I touched base on it a little bit before earlier in the presentation. Uh, I would say the best scenario for reducing midge fly and mosquito populations would be to implement both aeration and nanotechnology. Uh, reason behind this is to uh, enhance the fisheries uh, habitat, which in, will increase predation and create conditions that disrupt the midge larval habitat in the benthos. Yeah. Um, of course, with the, um, you know, it's a multifaceted approach. So you also want to have the biological control, which is the having the predatory fish. But again, that goes back to you have to have conditions that promote that fisheries habitat, which uh, both aeration and nanobubble technology. Uh, do just that. So moving on to the next question, uh, Stacy in North Carolina. Um, are nanobubbles effective in large lakes or is it better for smaller water bodies? Uh, Nick, you want to handle this one? Yeah, so so in our case with our products, we we do deploy our systems to large bodies of water as well. So the way the Moliere nanobubble generator works, I can only speak to our system, is uh, uh, it's a function of flow rate. So we go as low as 50 gallons a minute, we go as high as 1,000 gallons a minute of water being pumped through our system and then being reintroduced back, enriched with, with nanobubbles. And so we can deploy those systems eventually to, to any, any body of water, always being a function of the size of water and the number of nanobubble systems you need to treat the water effectively. So it's scalable to any any size. Awesome, thanks, Nick. Um, Donna from Georgia. Are there different fountain patterns for ponds? That seems it's a pretty common question here. Uh, Shannon, I'm sure you get this one all the time. Yeah, there are a lot of spray patterns. Um, there's frothy 
uh, airy patterns, there's tall skinny ones, there's individual streams and more complicated patterns. Um, if you go on our website, you can actually, there's pictures of all of the different patterns that are available with, with each unit. Um, I would say for aeration purposes, it would be important to have a full flow pattern. So the less restriction, the better. So you would want to have the, the highest pumping rate available. So for those small, spindly, streamy patterns, you don't get the same aeration benefits that you would get from kind of that traditional arc pattern that doesn't have a nozzle and just is a, a full spray. Great, thanks Shannon. Um, this one's from Dennis in Pennsylvania. Can I utilize nanobubbles if my water body doesn't have access to electricity? Nick, this is a good one for you. Yeah, so so it, it can be powered through solar. Um, we as a company don't offer it. What we would do is if it's something that's sold to us prepared to, to provide, we provide the electrical requirements to them and, and then they would ultimately determine if it's something that, that they would be willing to, uh, to to support. And of course, you know, it's always, always going to be up to what other infrastructure is necessary, but um, uh, it's possible, but it's not something that we provide with our systems. Great. Thanks, Nick. Uh, next question. This one is from Massachusetts. Kelly from Massachusetts. Uh, which strategy, aeration or nanobubbles, is best for reducing muck and organic matter buildup? Uh, Shannon, why don't you grab this one? Uh, how many times can we say it depends? Um, actually, um, you know, any of the systems would would be helpful for this. Maybe not so much fountains, but diffused air systems and nanobubbles would both help. It's actually the beneficial bacteria that breaks down the organic muck and not the oxygen itself. So either one of those systems would add oxygen to the pond down near that sediment water interface and would promote that breakdown of muck. So again, you know, either either one would be helpful and it would, be, you know, kind of, you would need to look at what the other goals for the water body are to make the decision of which would be better. Yeah, well said, Shannon, thanks. Was there, Nick, did you want to add, add to that no, at all? No, it's exactly, it's, it's about getting that oxygen levels down near the sediment and that's, that's, that's what we see. Yep, aerobic bacteria is the key. Um, all right, uh, let's see. Mariah from Colorado, how loud are aeration and nanobubble systems? Um, I'm gonna grab this one, but Nick, Shannon, feel free to uh, keep me honest here. Um, really, aeration and nanobubble systems are no louder than any residential air conditioner or pool. Um, that's, you know, we've seen a bunch of them go in in Florida, both aeration and nano, and that's, that's really, it's about the, the same, Kind of white noise as a, as a residential air conditioner. So, good deal. I got a, a couple other questions that are rolling in here. Uh, we still have some time, so um, let's see. Uh, many people are asking this question. Uh, you mentioned fountains are ideal for shallow water bodies. Can you define shallow? Um, I'm gonna pass this, I'll open it up, Shannon, if you wanna start first, I mean, it's. Sure, yeah, I can start. So yeah, um, diffused air systems don't really work well in very shallow water bodies because there's just not enough, enough depth for the bubbles to kind of spread out and effectively circulate. And also they tend to not be stratified. Um, so for the shallow water body, getting that circulation and that lack of stagnation, a fountain would be better. Um, there's still a required minimum depth though. So, you know, I think the shallowest water body that we could aerate would be 16 to 18 inches. And, you know, that's not ideal. You know, we'd like to see at least two feet to, you know, that even with that two feet, you're probably looking at a horizontally mounted motor and they tend to be more prone to clogging and things like that. Um, as far as the, Maximum depth, I would say if you have water that's deeper than four feet, maybe six feet, um, you would probably want to look at diffused air versus a fountain. I don't know if anyone else has more to add than that. The only thing I would add is, is, is if there's a challenge with depth and you're not able to deploy other systems, nanobubbles do have that 
distinct advantage in that the bubbles we don't care about depth. The bubbles don't care. They're going to travel everywhere. Yeah. So uh, that's that is one point. way that that's a it becomes a limiting factor. Great, thank you. Um, great, great answers there, and gr great question. Um, next, we have uh, one from Mary. Uh, what if you have water levels fluctuating from year to year? Does that affect which option to choose? Um, I'm going to start off, and then I'll open it up with with uh, Nick and Shannon. Um, it really every water body is unique. So my suggestion here is to uh, either fill out a survey, get a hold of one of our um, our lake management professionals, and and we can survey the lake and and figure out the the best approach. And then I'll pass it over to Shannon and Nick. I would say, um, you know, fluctuating water levels for a fountain might, you know, from year to year wouldn't matter, you know, wouldn't matter that much. We could adjust the anchor tension to allow for a little bit of rise and fall with the water level. Um, if it becomes extreme, you know, if you're looking at three to four feet of depth difference during storm events and things, that can cause problems. Or, you know, obviously if you get below you know, get a really low water level where the fountain starts sitting on the bottom, then that wouldn't be ideal either. Um, but again, I think nano bubbles and Nick, I'll let you take that part, but I don't think it would be as much of a concern there. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. The only consideration is that we have an intake, right? Where the water is gonna be drawn up into our system before it gets pumped back down. And so we just need to make sure the intake is below the water line. And as long as we're below the water line, our pump's not going to you know, run dry. And so therefore, we can we can handle the fluctuations to that extent. Great, thanks, uh, Shannon and Nick and, and Mary. Great question. Um, moving on, uh, yeah, the chat questions are, are rolling in here. That's great. Um, so we have Jay. Uh, can you have too much oxygen in the water? Um, so. Shannon, I'm going to let you handle this and then again open it up to, to Nick because uh, this is a typical question I know we get from uh, with aeration and then Nick, I'm sure it's the same question for nanos too. So Shannon, why don't you start? Yeah, and I'm sure, yeah, I would bet that Nick probably knows more about this than I do. But yeah, you can get super saturation, which can be problematic with fountains and aeration systems. That's not going to occur naturally, but I think it might be more of a risk perhaps with nanobubbles? I don't know, Nick, maybe you could explain that. Yeah, so, so bear with me for a little bit of a longer answer. So, um, you know, the, the natural saturation point of water with dissolved oxygen, it's gonna function with temperature elevation, but it's around nine or 10 ppm. Um, that's when you use air. If you use pure oxygen, you can go above that. It's one of the reasons that our systems that are designed for ponds and lakes don't use pure oxygen, it's to make sure we don't go uh, and supersaturate well beyond that point. That could harm fish or other wildlife in that water. And, and I think just from a risk management perspective, without having to know everything about every body of water, it provides uh, a bit more you know, management associated with that. So we generally don't aim to go and supersaturate these applications. We do in others, particularly in irrigation water and, and greenhouses, but here we, we keep it to air for that reason and therefore we don't run into those problems. And, but again, you know, neither a fountain nor an aeration system, you're not going to get super saturation just from natural circulation of the water body. Great. Yeah, thanks. I think it's uh, kind of a good time to add this too, is it, you can super saturate, but it's also important not to under aerate a system. Uh, Shannon, do you mind uh, just touching on that r real quick? And or Shannon and Nick? Sure. Yeah, I mean, what can happen if you use too small of an aeration system? Um, as we discussed, the water at the bottom of the pond tends to have poor water quality down near the sediment. It's got less oxygen. It's got a lot of nutrients in it. So if you use too small of an aeration system, it will bring that poor quality water up and mix it in with the rest of the water column. But if you're not getting adequate circulation to continually move the entire water body and turn it over frequently enough, then you can actually cause more harm than good. So it is extremely important to size the systems properly. And even in you know extremely poor water quality situations and deeper water bodies, when we're first turning on an aeration system, 
we we do need to be careful and use kind of a staggered startup. If we just throw an aeration system in a pond and turn it on full blast, that can cause problems. So if we know that there's compromised water quality, we need to be careful at startup as well. Great. Uh, anything you wanted to add there, Nick? Or? No, that was, no, I totally agree with Shannon. That's perfect. That was exactly right. No, no Great. More Thanks. Um, all right, let's uh, let's move on. We got another one here from David. Could aeration and nanobubble treatments minimize the need for dredging? I think we've we haven't specifically gone after dredging, but I think it's it's kind of the same old thing with going back to promoting beneficial bacteria, which will then break down naturally, break down and consume that muck. Um, again. Keep, keep me honest here. Uh, Nick, I'll let you start with this one if you want. No, I think that's right. I think, you know, if we're able to break down the, the muck layer through the promotion of beneficial bacteria, then, then we can reduce or potentially avoid dredging uh, altogether. But I think that's that's right. Great. Yeah, I would want to make one distinction, though, between organic muck and sediment. Um, you know, we can break down organic matter. Bacteria can break that down. But if the problem of sediment buildup is caused from, you know, sand and soil that is being washed into a pond. That needs to be physically removed. That does not break down um, any further than the soil particles. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, well said. Um, so this one comes from Arthur. Uh, do these systems help with mosquito control? Um, I'm, I'll, I'll start off and I, I would say, uh, yes, mosquito, typically mosquitoes are, are not, um, their favorite habitat is not in, in a pond that has a lot of uh, wave action and things like that. So one way that both aeration and nanobubbles would help is to, um, you know, have constant movement because their larval stage is at the surface as opposed to the midge fly, which is at the benthos or the bottom. Um, so in, in that aspect, it would it would help. Uh, anything, uh, Nick or Shannon, you want to add to that? Yeah, I would just say also having the added oxygen, you know, it increases the health of the water body and it improves the habitat for aquatic organisms, things like, you know, frogs and fish and other organisms that would eat the larvae. So in that way, it can also enhance and, you know, prevent mosquitoes. Yeah, good point. Great point. Thanks, Shannon. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. We have Richard. Would you, would one nanobubble unit provide effective treatment for interconnected water body, bodies? This one is right up your alley. <laughs> uh, and unfortunately, you're going to get the same answer you're getting a lot, which is it depends. Um, it's a function of size. We, we've done it and we've done it successfully, but we would we would look at two things. We would look at uh, the flow in between the two and make sure it's somewhat continuous. And then we look at the volume of both together. And, and in our mind, we think of it as one. And then we size the nano level system for that one uh, total volume. So it can, it can be done. Great. Thanks, Nick. Um, all right. We're going to wrap up with one last question here from chat. Um, this is from Dave. Uh, do you recommend adding beneficial bacteria with aeration? Shannon, do you want to take this one? Yeah. Um, we actually do use beneficial bacteria products in a lot of our maintenance programs. Um, you know, inoculating the water body with additional bacteria is a great idea. It's sort of like probiotics, how, you know, humans take probiotics to improve their digestion. It, you know the beneficial bacteria does the same thing for a pond so we do use it a lot it actually does work better in aerobic conditions so um you know aeration and beneficial bacteria complement each other very well as i'm sure uh the nanobubbles as well yeah the only thing i'd add Jen, to that is you know from from our perspective you know, we work with companies like sold to to help you know, the client ultimately determine what's the best solution. But I'll tell you that when beneficial bacteria is added from our observations, it always is a better outcome. Uh, you're just going to get faster treatment. You're going to get a healthier pond to the point that Shannon brought up. Great. 
Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, Nick. Well, thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. Please take make sure you take a few moments to complete our post-webinar survey. Your feedback is greatly appreciated. Uh, one random uh, survey participant will receive a $50 Amazon gift card and a Solitude swag bag. Um, again, that Solitude swag bag is pretty cool. And gift card's not bad either. So if you would like to discuss your management goals with one of our representatives, there is an option on the survey to request a free consultation. And that is as an added thank you, all, all attendees today, we are offering up to 500 free beneficial buffer plants for any nanobubble treatment or aeration contract signed by the end of July, 2020. All you have to do is mention the webinar when discussing with your Solitude representative. And I do just want to note that that uh, 500 plants includes the plants, obviously, and the install. So again, thank you, everybody. Appreciate your time. Stay safe, be healthy, and have a great Thursday afternoon.